So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those attending this webinar. My name is Jo Yelmus and I'm the co-founder of The Aviation Base. To coincide with World Environment Day on the 5th of June, we launched Sustainability Month where all of our content for June will be dedicated to this important topic. If you haven't done already, please follow our social media channels and website for some more details. To kickstart our programme, we are really pleased to have you today for our webinar where we'll be addressing the three pillars of sustainability for aviation. We have an excellent group of speakers who you'll see here now today who will be talking through some of the steps that the industry are taking to ensure the ongoing relevance of aviation for future generations. I'll introduce you properly in a moment, but before we get started, I need to cover off a few bits. I'm sure everyone is more than familiar now with online communication and technology, um, and this webinar will be no different to ones that you may have seen before. This platform automatically mutes you and your video is not on, so um, we can't see you. However, you do have the ability to communicate with us, and that's through the chat box that you'll see on the right hand side. So each of our expert speakers will be giving a short presentation and then we'll open the floor to questions at the end. But please do feel free to post questions as we go through. Um, if you've got any questions for some specific speakers, please make sure that you, um, you say that so that I can direct them to the right person. And if for any reason you experience any technical issues, then there is a reboot button at the top. Um, should you need it, which will refresh you and bring you back into the room. First up today, um, we have Dr. Suzanne Kens, who's an Associate Professor of Aviation at the University of Waterloo. And she's going to be joined by Simon Witts, who's Chairman of NGAP UK and Founder and CEO of ISD. And last but not least, at the end of um, the session today, we're going to have Alexander Ferre, who is the founder and CEO of Open Airlines, who are an international software company on a mission to help airlines reduce their fuel consumption. So enough from me now and uh, we'll get started. So over to you, Suzanne and Simon. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. I know myself, uh, being more of a traditional aviation person, uh, learning about sustainability is something that I came to relatively late into my career. And, and it did uh, take a bit of sort of research and investigation to really understand what it meant. But I think when you really understand these three pillars, it does contextualize that aviation can be a tremendous source for good in the world if we are mindful and consider it and doing everything we can to invest in reducing the negative environmental impacts. So I'm um, very excited um, to speak to you today. And Simon, would you like to give a few words before we move on? Well, thank you, Suzanne. And it's great to be speaking to you today and working alongside Suzanne to talk about Project NGAP, engaging the next generation of aviation professionals. And really like to, uh, to talk about how the sustainability pillars can be activated and the practical plans that we'll talk about today uh, how we can bring them bring them alive and actually uh, bring them to you. So, uh, without further ado, back to you, Suzanne, and we can do uh, do an introduction if that's all right with the uh, the video. Absolutely. So we have a quick video to introduce uh, what we've been working on. Oh, sorry, since it's gone the wrong way, I'll just put it. Just hang on one second. This is at the end of the presentation. Little gremlin, hang on a sec. Some reason it started the presentation at the end which is always a good place to start so, <laughs> an opportunity to chat amongst yourselves and uh, it's like starting with the learning objectives right like when you're teaching a class you begin yes, it with <laughs> i didn't realize that perhaps i should make a habit of starting presentations at the end Suzanne, <laughs> Couple of minutes, just saying a little bit about yourself and your yeah. background. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, uh, I can give you um, some of the origin for some of this before we play the video. So, I've been uh, an aviation professor now for, gosh, I think seventeen years, and and I think it's the best job in the world, uh, primarily because I just really enjoy teaching young, passionate aviation students. Um, I, I relate, I think, to to their journey and their passion and their enthusiasm. But what's really struck me in 
the most recent years is increasingly these young people come up to me uh, usually after class in sort of a hushed tone and they say hey my friends are really giving me a hard time because they say why would you want to be a part of an industry that's the problem like why why would you why do you feel justified in being passionate and having enthusiasm for aviation because basically aviation's the villain and thereby you're the villain and and so they feel hurt that that this industry that they feel like I think all of us who love aviation you it's almost like this it's a passion and a hobby and you know it's it's part of our life and and uh, they these young people care about the environment and and they they're invested in it and they want to support a sustainable future but it, it's at odds with their love for aviation and and this is I think where sustainability um, can fill that gap in perspective so maybe we'll play the video and then we can talk a little bit more about what that means perfect timing thank you so on to the video Thanks, Simon. So if you can, um, so so I think uh, what's helpful to understand is that uh, before the pandemic, so many aspects of aviation weren't sustainable even before the pandemic happened. So if you can think back to, you know, it feels like a lifetime ago now, but there was an increasing recognition of the negative environmental impacts of aviation. So Greta Thunberg, you know, leading a climate protest outside of ICAO uh, during their assembly and, and uh, increasing media coverage of people choosing not to travel by aviation because of its negative uh, environmental impacts. So this was growing in a way awareness and perception. Uh, at the same time, what we had was an industry that was projected to double. So between 2019 and 2036, all of the projections for both uh, airline, both passenger and cargo capacity were that they were uh, projected to double during that time. So we saw increasing environmental challenges and the projection of twice as many flights. Um, and with that, not enough people. So uh, here in Canada, what we were finding is that all of our aviation schools were at capacity. So we, we did not literally have additional seats. Um, even this year in our aviation program, we had around, I think, 800 applications uh, for about 100 spots. So, so there's still a significant demand. And what we were seeing increasing was airlines were um, hiring flight instructors out of the training schools to support those airlines, but in that process disrupts the entire training capacity. So it's not a sustainable workforce model. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense and it's not feasible for the longer term. 
Uh, and the third global challenge is all about technology. So if you look at not just how we train, but if you look at parallel fields and see what is the current state of the art when it comes to technology um, and where are we in aviation, I think it's quite clear that there's a bit of a gap there. Um, and of course, we need to prioritize safety and efficiency in our operations and that sometimes there are safeguards in that process that might slow the integration of technologies. But the reality is that without um, the evidence and direction to support the integration of these technologies in a safe and efficient way, um, then the industry is going to be challenged to keep up with the state of the art. So Project NG NGAP is, uh, you know, Simon and I, basically what happened is we had collaborated on a book that came out in March uh, of 2020, probably the worst timing for a book to come out about engaging the next generation. I remember thinking like, oh gosh, that's that seems terrible. I like guess literally the last thing on anyone's mind is how are we going to bring more young people into aviation right when the pandemic hit. Um, but Simon and I, of course, I think one thing we truly share is the, the love for our industry and, and the support of our industry and and we continued our conversations to say you know what maybe when we see the industry facing crisis it isn't the time to stop innovating it isn't the time to stop figuring out what we can do to collaborate to do things better but instead maybe it's even more so a priority and more important for people like us who aren't fully dedicated to operations like of course all of our colleagues and airlines like they are busy <laughs> they they certainly had um, you know a tremendous amount of work on their plate to survive the pandemic but the people who are in in different positions like us that perhaps instead it is the perfect time for us to think about innovating to support the sector so that we can address some of these big sustainability challenges and set the industry up for a better future. Simon, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you, you've summed it up really well, Suzanne. So I think it was an exciting time. A lot of new initiatives come out of a time of difficulty, a time of, of trouble. So um, that opportunity to rethink things and to restart things in perhaps a different way is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, which sounds really tough on the people who suffered out of it, but we want to make sure that the next generation of aviation professionals enjoy an even better experience in this industry that's uh, that served us so well. Uh, but actually, we need to look at also what are the new opportunities, what are the new initiatives out there that can make a real difference. In fact, some of those we haven't thought of yet. So uh, how do we inspire the next generation to actually take this industry forward uh, in a way that we haven't yet imagined? So, Suzanne, yeah. over to you to talk about uh, the sure. case. So, uh, for so NGAP, of course, uh, is its origin was in an ICAO program, the next generation of aviation professionals, and ICAO has done some tremendous work around how do you attract, educate, and retain people within our field. And the book that uh, that Simon contributed to that we collaborated on um, was all about looking at it from a bit of a different perspective. So it's about taking that initiative and moving it into an academic space and saying maybe this is a field of study, because I think one of the main reasons why we haven't been able to effectively tackle big obstacles in aviation, like, um, for example, gender and diversity, uh, like inclusion in aviation that uh, relatively in our sector, we haven't addressed that issue as well as other industries have. Um, and it, things like training and really, you know, bringing our training up to the cutting edge. Um, but a lot of these challenges, I think one of the reasons why it's difficult to move the discussion forward is because they don't fall under an academic discipline the way human factors, for example, does. And everybody works in, under the same umbrella to move that forward. Um, Simon, could you go to the next slide, please? So, uh, so from Project NGAP, of course, Simon is uh, tremendous when it comes to looking at how do you um, mobilize sort of a, a national system towards training. Um, and he'll talk more about that. I think you'll be fascinated to hear what he's doing. Um, but for my world, I'm, I'm an academic. So I, I'm a university professor, I'm a researcher and a writer, and I live in the university system. So when I was looking at the state of our industry after the pandemic hit, uh, with an awareness of the sustainability challenges that were being faced before the pandemic, and this really significant disruption in everybody's lives during the pandemic, where my head went was looking around campus where I am. So I am based at the University of Waterloo. It's one of the um, leading uh, technology universities. It's a tremendous uh, large school, lots of faculty, lots of students. Um, but what I found and what I was struck by was that very few of my fellow research professors engaged with aviation. And, and so what I started doing was having 
many conversations with different professors of all different kinds of backgrounds. And I would often say, you know, if you give me 15 minutes, I can connect how your research that you're already a leading expert in, you know, you're already doing amazingly innovative things. I can connect how that addresses challenges in the aviation space. And over um, quite a long period of time, uh, what we did is we've mobilized uh, a significant group of professors. And as of next week, uh, actually two weeks, uh, June 21st, um, the proposal to establish a new research institute will be considered by the University Senate. Um, the research institute is called WISA, or the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Aeronautics, but it's all about bringing together a large team of multidisciplinary faculty members and graduate students to create a hub of research around this issue, um, and really about informing public policy, but also directly supporting the industry around these sustainability issues. Um, so just a bit of a timeline. So um, I teach in our aviation program here at the University of Waterloo. We have about 300 student pilots on campus. And uh, for the first few years I was at Waterloo, my primary focus was supporting and developing the undergraduate program. But uh, when we reached capacity for the undergraduate program, I started the process of uh, talking to other professors and, and sort of engaging with them, as I mentioned. Um, so we formed sort of an unofficial research cluster just with a handful of faculty members um, in late 2019. And uh, I led a proposal to to purchase a flight simulator to be installed on campus, uh, fully dedicated for research activities. So um, some of the other applicants who are interested in using the simulator are studying everything from artificial intelligence and machine learning and how pilot skill develops to visual standards. So using special goggles that degrade your vision and, and identifying particularly at what point that affects your performance. That can inform medical certificates and the standards for medicals. Um, to people who look at gaze behavior, so how your eyes jump around a cockpit environment and collect information um, and the idea that that can actually be indicative of a person's competence. So, so marrying that gaze behavior to a competence model that there are a really wide variety of applications for this type of simulator. And uh, just actually last week, it was installed on campus. So that was really exciting. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, the NGAP book was published in the second quarter of 2020, and that's what led uh, Simon and I to continue thinking about NGAP as, as a focus area and NGAP Canada um, really taking the lead as far as establishing a research hub around these sustainability concepts. So it was really only the beginning of this year when we really looked at the Sustainability Institute, um, formalized the concept for what that could be. Uh, we had many conversations uh, both internally on campus and externally um, with government and industry partners. And we were really thankful to receive some significant support from university leadership. Uh, today, there are six faculties on campus, and we have uh, direct support from five of those faculty deans, uh, as well as the senior um, university provost in, in this um, application. So again, we will look towards June 21st uh, for WISA to officially be approved. And next slide, please. So what does it mean? So, so what is sustainability research? I think uh, this is really critical because although the environmental impacts um, of aviation are absolutely a, a tremendous focus. And we do have several research teams already on campus doing look into or doing work into right now they're looking at e-planes. So how do you get electrically powered aircraft for flight training purposes? How do we replace some of the traditional fleet? Um, it turns out that the vast majority of aircraft in Canada used in training were manufactured in the 1970s, not to mention they're burning leaded fuel and, and that has its own implications. So, so that's only one example, but you can imagine everything from sustainable fuels to more direct flight paths to leaning onto sort of the mechanical engineering side of research to look at um, modern airframe designs and technologies. But there's also the, the social pillar, and this is where NGAP really is uh, situated, is that social sustainability is probably the one pillar of sustainability that people have a harder time understanding. And uh, the way I define it is under this NGAP theme. So it's about how do you develop a sustainable workforce for the people? How do you make careers in aviation worthwhile so that people aren't leaving those careers you know, in, in the middle of their lives, but, but they feel fulfilled and they feel supported and they feel educated and they have opportunities for growth. So it's about attracting, 
educating and retaining them throughout their lives. But it involves everything from marketing and outreach, like how do you reach young people to consider aviation careers, to human factors, educating them about their own natural limitations. And that gets into things like well-being and mental health. Uh, flight physiology, keeping them healthy, keeping them effective, to educational technologies. How do we optimize how people are trained and learned and learn, as well as supporting equity, diversity, and inclusion? And I've also been collaborating with interesting researchers who take it one step further and look at sustainable tourism. This is something I've just been learning about more recently, but you may or may not know that nearly 60% of all international tourists travel by air. So during the pandemic, when all tourism was shut down, what they found was that a significant increase in poaching in Africa, uh, a lot of communities that rely on those dollars from tourism to keep their communities alive, um, that all of that ecotourism is basically shut down. It's having a significantly negative impact on, on a lot of people's lives around the world. So aviation and tourism are intertwined. And from an economic uh, sustainability perspective, we really do, because we're Waterloo, we take more of a technology focus to it. So uh, I always uh, say that I think that the future of aviation is almost difficult for us to imagine today because it's going to change so much. Uh, so we need to start preparing the next generation of leaders to be able to function in this space. So everything from our past to AI, cybersecurity, and optimization. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and another thing that's really special, and because, um, I always say aviation students are my people. I, I want to make sure that they're not lost in all of the, uh, this research that happens and not exploited. That's absolutely critical to me because I think in our in our sector, we need to support uh, the next generation. So what I've uh, structured for the Institute is an idea where having hundreds of student pilots on campus is actually this really unique ecosystem because they can support the research as participants and those are paid positions. And then researchers in turn have access to this large pool of pilots and training who are sort of locked step progressing and training at the same rate, which is a really unique uh, attribute as well. So I'm hoping that this uh, supports sort of a mutually beneficial ecosystem that's supporting both the students and the researchers. Um, we're also wanting to look at a, a really unique graduate program. So uh, pretty much in Canada, it's very rare to have master's and PhD programs in aviation. I know other parts of the world, it's, it's far more common. Um, but what we want to do at Waterloo is very reflective of what the Institute wants to do, which is a, what's called a collaborative aeronautics program. And what this means is that if I was a wanted to get a master's or a PhD, in something aviation related, I would apply to one of a number of programs at Waterloo, so maybe a master's in psychology or a PhD in engineering. And while I'm completing that study, uh, during my elective courses, so I would come together with other uh, multidisciplinary students from across campus and I would complete two aeronautics courses, um, including integration with industry and field trips, and I would um, have sort of a big challenge at the end to produce uh, some really interesting work. And then I would go back to my home department and I would focus my research on aviation. And then when those students graduate, they would get a dash aeronautics on their diploma. So whether it's a master's in psychology, dash aeronautics, or a PhD in engineering, dash aeronautics. And the, th the reason why I think this is so powerful is because we're not leaning into just aviation as a discipline. What we're doing is we're tapping into sort of the cutting edge and leading experts in a wide variety of different disciplines and creating the next generation of aviation leaders who can support our sector. We're hoping this will launch in September of next year. Uh, we also want to support uh, the development of certificate courses. So in addition to supporting um, you know, our undergraduate students in the flying program, our graduate students through the collaborative program, recognizing that a lot of people around the world can't leave their jobs and come to campus for a full-time degree, uh, we also want to support a variety of certificate-based courses that would be um, sort of stackable, micro-credential, uh, that's the concept, um, so that people can look at upskilling uh, some of their abilities. And some of these early courses we're looking at are the Aviation Fundamentals course, which is an introduction to aviation for people who are maybe transitioning professionals from another field or youth. Uh, and we're also looking uh, today at some new courses around technology. So what does AI mean in aviation and, and what do these concepts look like? 
Um, equity, diversity, inclusion, I think, is an absolutely critical pillar for what we want to do in the future. Um, and again, I sort of think about WISA, this research institute, trying to provide some leadership for the air transport sector at the interface of society, inclusivity, and technology. Um, there is a real distinct lack of diversity in aviation. Again, only about 5% of airline pilots are women, and, and Black women represent less than 1%. Uh, so we want to make sure everything we're doing that is giving uh, voices to racialized communities and to really invest uh, even things like our training and assessment systems to identify if there's any bias that could potentially be holding people back. So just some key research capabilities, uh, not to read them all, but everything from AI, uh, sustainability is the heart uh, of what our institute is, um, cybersecurity, geomatics, training, health, uh, vision science and physiology, and augmented virtual reality. These are some of the, the key areas we're starting with. So overall, uh, I'm hoping in two weeks uh, on the 21st, um, there'll be a, an announcement on LinkedIn with some really good news that WISA has been approved and it ex exists, and, and then we get to actually start with the work. So uh, I do hope uh, that this is something that can be in service to the industry. That is my number one goal, is to really mobilize research capacity to support our sector. So if the aviation industry has big challenges or needs, um, then they can come to us uh, to help, help collaborate with us to find these answers and because we're not for profit, because any of those, um, you know, sponsored research, it doesn't, it doesn't affect uh, faculty salaries. It really does fund students and the development of students, and that supports the pipeline, right? So then we get and then more and more uh, young people joining our industry who are highly qualified and in a position to be leaders in the future. And that's all I got. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Suzanne, and uh, very keen to. Uh, to point out at this stage how this collaboration we, we see growing since we first started working together. So the one way of, of doing this would be to almost parallel the discussion about Canada and how we do that in the UK. But but we decided under the project and NGAP umbrella, we would take a bit of a different tack is that we would focus on a different element of the uh, of the, the global challenges in terms of the generation of the right people with the right skills in a complementary way. And as we round off this presentation and at the end of this uh, session, We'll talk about how we can mutually work together to make sure that, that what works in one country can then be uh, collaborated into the next, et cetera, and how we start to syndicate this activity uh, globally. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the NGAP uh, UK initiatives, and I'm going to start with a, uh, a video uh, after I just talk about the focus areas. So that, to me, the right programs and the right partnerships may be self-evidently to most people listening is around attracting the right people to the industry, the right people with the right skills. And uh, Suzanne's talked about some of the priority areas. How do we get more people of color into the industry? How do we get more uh, people in, a, in, a, in the right gender balance, uh, diversity inclusivity mix? And what are the practical and achievable ways we can do this? What are the ways that, that really work? We don't want to, to perhaps replicate things that have, uh, haven't really solved the problem because as Suzanne pointed out at the start, Going into the global pandemic, we had a global uh, critical sh skills shortage. We need to bounce out of the pandemic with some solutions that work. And as I've mentioned, finally, to sort out the diversity and inclusivity aspects, which to me are, are a problem that, that really uh, continues to grow in the industry. We need some really uh, important and, and uh, significant initiatives that are going to, to, going to solve this. So the International Air and Space Training Institute is an idea that was born out of uh, discussions with, with Suzanne and, uh, and similar to the, uh, the approach in Canada in terms of how do we bring all the elements together. So it's giving the people the right skills. It's a full partnership in Get UK being a not-for-profit, a social enterprise organization working with IASTI, putting on the ground solutions across the UK. One of the challenges in the UK is that we don't really have aviation focus areas in just one location. We actually need to syndicate this across the country to make sure that people from all walks of life across the country can access these opportunities. And we need to directly influence, play our part in the global personnel shortage. Although we're talking about a UK solution here, of course, aviation being international, we can we can work across borders to make this work. And in, in terms of partnerships with the right education and training partners, make sure that at all ages, we embed the industry training into the education system uh, and bring it alive. So I'm just gonna play you a short video and then sum up what the ISD is. And well, uh, Suzanne and I will then round up with a uh, 
how we're going to talk about collaboration in the future. So IASTI is a, is a partnership across a number of different organizations to actually bring all of this, uh, this activity alive, bring it together. Now we need a solution that starts working today. Uh, so the deployment of, of IASTI is a, is a significant part of this. How do we actually bring alive a model that, that suits the industry at the top, feeding the industry jobs, bringing in the original equipment manufacturers, the aircraft manufacturers into that? Uh, and linking the people that want to get into the industry at, at the bottom. So we have the operating industry that's pulling people. Yes, we need more people with the right skills. People and parents, yes, I'd like to get into this industry. How do I get into it? It looks a confusing access. Where do I start? And we have industry training at one end and the education system at the other. So this is a blending of, of all the aspects together, connecting the right people to the right jobs through the right pathways and educating and training to industry standard with the right partners. So this is happening. We've launched in March 2021. We launched uh, IST Newark, uh, Newark Nottinghamshire, in partnership with the Lincoln College Group, and that's covering all ages, pre-16, post-16, post-18, and including apprenticeships. And IST London City has been launched uh, and will formally launch in July uh, as a partnership with the London Design and Engineering University Technical College. And again, covering all of the different uh, age ranges in partnership with the universities, colleges, schools. NGAP UK activates these in the regions, so it, it's connected into the, to the different locations, making sure it brings together charities, uh, support organisations, councils, uh, local authorities, people, organisations, to make sure that we get the right blend of people coming in to attract them into the industry, educate them and ensure that they retain. And three initial focus areas being the aircraft engineering side, the ground operations side, including flight dispatch and the pilot side. And really making sure that all of the people skills that we need are combined at the start. So that group of people need to understand each other's roles. So, how, so we integrate those at the start of the pathways to make sure that people understand each other's roles, have a mutual respect for the roles, but are also a mutual understanding of what's required in those areas. So deploying across the, uh, the UK. And if we link it right back to the start, then making sure that, that we face up to the challenges, the global challenges we've talked about, lay the foundations for the future, make the right connections with the partners, create the right pathways, deploy the right opportunities in, in the UK. And part of our plan is then to work, work with international partners to globalize this, this plan and get back to a situation where we can have a reliable supply of the right skilled people across the globe uh, as we bounce back from the, the pandemic. 
So Suzanne and I really, Suzanne comes back on screen to talk about future collaboration opportunities. Uh, and it won't surprise you to know, as, as far as we're concerned, that we, we want to spark a coordinated approach to global challenges. We're talking here about Canada and the UK, but we've already started discussions with organizations in the USA and other countries about how we can coordinate this approach. What we don't want to do is to have lots of different people doing the same things differently. Ideally, we have specialist areas, Suzanne leading on global research um, programs, and we coordinate those into the UK and vice versa in terms of NGAP Canada, learning from the experience of Canada, how can we make sure that the, the UK pilot is not just suited to the UK and sharing best practice on the diversity and inclusivity programs. So, and growing new country chapters as we, as we move along. So Suzanne. Yeah, I think that, um, if there is a, a significant challenge in sort of the history of aviation and how we've done training and skill development in our workforce over the over the past is that we all sort of do things separately right so so it's this scattershot approach and everybody is um, maybe addressing the same problems but i'm working on problem a and so simon and you know so somebody in australia and, and, and all of the other parts of the world when in reality if we could each build uh collectively on the previous work that's been done that's how we we can shift our industry and move it forward and and even though I like I'm, I'm really passionate about aviation students and I, I love the um, the ability to work with them and to educate them I also recognized through working with Simon that um, you know, we all need to lean into our unique strengths. And so from, from my role in a university, it's really about how research can be mobilized to support the sector. And, and it, I think it's by each of us sort of leaning into, um, you know, what is uniquely a value that we can do to support these big challenges. That's how we can uh, really mobilize and move things forward. So I think that this is a, a an exciting model. I, I hope that others also see the value in it and maybe could help support us as we look to really move this to the next level. So I think that's the end of our presentation, Joe. Thank you very much. Really interesting to hear all the, the great work that you're doing. And then, yeah, keeping my fingers crossed for you for the announcement on the, on the 21st of June, did you say? Yeah, yeah we'll, you'll either we'll see look. like a very positive LinkedIn announcement on like the 21st or the 22nd, or you'll see like a not so happy Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of those two things is going to happen, but I think we've got enough support that it, it's going to um, hopefully move forward. But it's it's been it's been exciting. Oh, fantastic! Well, thank you very much for giving us some information. And um, to everybody that's listening, please remember to keep um, putting your comments. It's really greatly appreciated your comments in the chat box. And if you do have any questions, then um, Simon and Suzanne will be back after Alexander's um, presentation to be able to answer those. Okay, so Alexander, without further ado, I'll just start your presentation now. Good morning and uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Alex Ferre. I'm the founder and CEO of Open Airlines. Open Airlines is an innovative software provider for airlines. We are based in Toulouse. And our raison d'être is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable aviation through digital technology. And obviously, um, I will um, take this opportunity to explain how our story relates to the three pillars of sustainable aviation. Um, as Suzanne and, and uh, Simon have mentioned it, there are you know, challenges for aviation. Um, the three sustainable pillars of aviation, we also call them the three Ps for people, planet, and profit. Uh, P can also stand for pressure, actually, especially right now. Aviation is under social pressure. As Suzanne said, since 2018, an anti-aircraft movement led by the young and influential activist Greta Thunberg has developed across Europe and beyond in America. Um, in Sweden, before COVID, it is uh, believed that the boycott will have caused a drop of traffic in one year, according to a Swedish transport agency. Aviation is under environmental pressure. You probably know that aviation represents around 3% of worldwide CO2 emissions. Uh, it seems like a small number, but you shouldn't hide behind it because considering the urgency to stop climate change, you know, every percentage counts. And finally, aviation is under tremendous economic pressure. Uh, due to coronavirus, we are living in an unprecedented worldwide crisis. COVID-19 has contaminated and continues to contaminate pe 
millions of people all over the world, leading to drastic measures and precedent in modern times, curfews, lockdown, and border closures. The economic crisis is one of the strongest the world has ever experienced, and it is even more so for all of us in the airline industry. The whole industry struggles. The airlines have accumulated last year more than 100 billion profit losses, billion dollars, a drop of 65% of demand, and it's estimated that more than 10 million jobs are at risk globally. And as traffic will come back, the aviation industry will immediately have to face its biggest challenge ever, probably way more daunting than COVID-19, climate change. Considering the annual increase in air traffic, because it will come back, and the lack of alternative means of transportation on most routes, CO2 emissions are expected to grow by 45% in the next 15 years. Without waiting for the hydrogen aircraft or electrical aircraft, you know, there are opportunities to reduce fuel burn and consequently CO2 emissions today by optimizing current flight optimization. And I will explain you how we contribute to that. Um, at Open Airlines, we have developed a, a SkyBrave, uh, a software called SkyBrave. It is a software that collects all the data from the black boxes, but also from weather, air traffic control, and maintenance. And through big data algorithms and artificial intelligence, it produces recommendations for airlines and pilots that let them reduce their fuel consumption and their CO2 emissions by up to 5% without any modification of the aircraft. These recommendations, and there can be many, can take place before the flight by suggesting proactive maintenance on the aircraft or recommending best practices based on best routes, uh, based on weather or traffic, or by suggesting to pilots, for example, to shut down one engine on the ground and reduce the taxi consumption. We equip all the pilots with a mobile app that acts as a virtual coach on their side. We help airlines improve their fuel efficiency in all business areas, you know, flight ops, dispatch, maintenance, even ground and commercial operations. But since day one, we've paid a special attention to pilots. They are the ones flying. And obviously, they do have a lot of impact on the fuel efficiency of the airline. We've worked with pilots since the beginning of our projects. We understand them, we've got their trust, and this is giving incredible results. This diagram from Cebu Pacific, a low-cost airlines in the Philippines, shows how they made spectacular progress in fuel preservation by engaging their pilots with SkyBrave. The curves you see are level of application of what we could call green operating procedures, or I would say, you know, fuel-saving, eco-flying practices. Um, and we can see on this graph that since they introduced SkyBrave on the My Fuel Coach app, the application of fuel-saving best practices by their pilots, such as engine out taxi, idle reverse thrust, or reduce acceleration altitude, have increased dramatically from, for some of them, almost no application before the introduction to it of a tool, up to 80% level of application after that. And this has very quick impact on their bottom line also, because it's saving them 35 million US dollars per year. So we address also the, you know, the profit, the P for profit. Um, this is one example, but uh, in the last five, five years, I would say, we have deployed the solution in more than 30 countries all around the globe on all continents on all kinds of airlines of all business, business models, flag carriers, low-cost carriers, cargo airlines or regional airlines. Uh, and we have been a, become a leader in the marketplace. Now I would like to speak about the third P, the one that stands for people. Obviously, it's the one that is most dear to our heart. You know, more than technology, people are what makes the world moving. And people are inspiration for change. And when we work on sustainable aviation, I believe nobody beats Bertrand Picard, another P, the greenest, greenest pilot on Earth for this inspiration. As SkyWave was one of the first solutions labeled by Bertrand Picard's Solar Impulse Foundation, I had the chance to present him our solution, and I had a long conversation with him. 
And this year, we are launching the Green Pilot movement. The Green Pilot idea was actually born during this conversation with Bertrand Picard. And we created the Green Pilot movement to bring pilots and aviation professionals together to enact real change. We want to strengthen synergies between members to promote green actions and eliminate as much CO2 as possible to make air, air travel as efficient and economical as it can be. We also aim to raise awareness on the world aviation industry's effort for the environment because people are not sufficiently aware of these actions. We think that information needs to be spread on a larger scale and to the general public, another P. If aviation is encouraged, if it's acknowledged and helped in its transformation, it will develop existing initiatives and tap into new ideas. And we are very happy and proud, again, another P, that Bertrand Picard and the Solar Impulse Foundation have endorsed the movement and have accepted to be its official godfather. Now, to go back to the three Ps at the beginning of my presentation, you know, on, I wanted to explain how we relate to these three Ps. Uh, thanks to SkyRiv, our customers, you know, these uh, 40 something airlines around the world, they have saved more than 150 million US dollars. So, you know, we are a domain where economy and ecology go together. In terms of CO2, this represents almost 600,000 tons of CO2, which is like planting 75 million trees. And uh, for the people, you know, I've just announced this green pilot movement, you know, the community is, is thriving very, very quickly. We aim at, you know, having more than 1,000 members by this summer. Uh, so if you believe that green aviation is possible, if you want to show your support, and you know, uh, be part of a solution, then join the movement at greenpilots.com. You know, it's free and, uh, and you'll be welcome as a member and you can show your pride. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander. Really great um, presentation there. Um, should I, um, would it be possible just to put the link into um, the Green Pilot? into the uh, chat box, just if anybody wants to, sure. to check it out. I do that, thank you. Great, thank you. So would um, Suzanne and Simon like to come back? And what we'll do is we'll just stop that slide presentation there. Um, please feel free if you um, want to ask any questions. I know that some people have been connecting um, on private message, which is fantastic. Um, so um, that's what this is all about and connecting people and joining in the conversation, which is fantastic. Um, while we just wait for a couple of questions to come through, I have um, my own, if I may. Um, and I guess this is for, for all of the speakers. Um, do you think that there is a place for sustainability awareness and practices within the training environment. Um, I know I, it's probably quite outdated my training now. I, I trained as a pilot in 2007, um, which is a while ago, but I can't remember this subject really being part of the syllabus or the context. I'm not sure if it is at this moment. Do you think there is a place for it going forward? I, I can add sort of my perspective. So I went through the same thing, like training to be a pilot, flying airplanes and helicopters. I went through Ember-Riddle in the States. And through all of that, it was almost that aviation and environmental considerations were opposite uh, cultures rather than sort of the same culture. And uh, so I, I taught as a professor for 12 years at one university. And then I, I moved to the University of Waterloo, where our aviation program is actually in the Faculty of Environment. And, and so I was, for the first time, an aviation person surrounded by all of my colleagues being environmental scientists. And I remember at the very beginning of that thinking, this does not fit. Like th this seems, you know, it seems so foreign to, to what aviation has always been and my understanding of it was. But what I've come to appreciate and recognize is, is actually the opposite. It's, it's such a tremendous strength because the reality is 
we all have the same toolbox, right? Like if you're all educated in the same way, the skills and strategies you use to solve problems, like my toolbox is probably very similar to most aviation professionals, but what we need to address our future is a new tool, like a new toolbox, somebody who's coming in with new ideas and, and new solutions and, and all sorts of um, new strategies to support our future. So I've been teaching a new course in aviation sustainability on campus. It's part of our undergraduate degree for the past three years. Um, and, and that's, I think, um, you know, one of the ways we've moved into it. But likewise, the, the textbook that I wrote, The Fundamentals of International Aviation, it's used all over the world in translations. Um, it does have a chapter in it as well about the environment and it's about weather. And then two thirds of it are about the negative environmental impacts of aviation and sustainability and sustainable development goals. So I think we need to do better in, in having this be part of of what we teach from the very beginning and only by leaning into and acknowledging that this is a problem can we really start mobilizing solutions yeah i think doing that against a backdrop of, of facts rather than perhaps fiction is something we've, we've talked about as well and so, so educating people forward to me should be celebrating the progress that's been made over the years already in in sustainability and uh, environmental impact of aircraft it, it, it I always get quite disappointed at the number of times I read about uh, what a polluting industry aviation is. It isn't really making the progress, whereas in fact, the facts don't bear that out. So one of the campaigns I believe we need to start from is a forward campaign of actually, yes, we need to make improvements. Yes, we should always be innovating, looking for new ways of doing things, but we should also do that against a backdrop of, of what it's like today. And sources like, uh, I know Alexandra has quoted the ATAG website, um, Air Transport Action Group based out of Geneva, but there's some really good data out there that, that it would be really nice to get, get more people to share around the actual environmental performance of aircraft today and the progress that's being made every time a new aircraft uh, type is introduced. Because uh, I think otherwise we'll be fighting against a, a negative uh, view of aviation as it's a polluting industry as, as actually inspiring people to join an industry where it's already got good credentials but could do better. Yeah, absolutely. And if I if I could just add really quickly, Joe, I think I think that's where sustainability as a perspective is really important because I don't think as an industry we can just rely on, you know, two percent, three percent of global emissions or our aviation. That's not so bad. Like we we can't accept that, right? That the future can't just accept that this is this is okay. It's not okay, right? Like we, we need to be exploring and moving towards reducing that as much as we possibly can. But the flip side to it is also acknowledging that there's a lot of good Good that aviation does. Like think about the jobs and the economic benefit and the, the social uh, benefit of bringing the world together and that 80% of emissions right now come from flights that are more than 1500 kilometers in duration where there's not another timely reasonable uh, mode of transportation. So, so I think we need to look at it's not just one thing, it's these balance between these three. How can we you know, really optimize all of the good that aviation does and also fully invest in reducing the negative environmental impacts. They're not at odds. And one quick story. So if you look at pilot training, for example, and we're looking at how we can shift more of that training into a simulator, when we do that, it's better for the student, more customized, it's less expensive, the profit margins are higher for flight schools and it's electrically powered. So there, there's less emissions. So, so e there are ways where you can sort of tick all these boxes is doing things better in the three pillars that, that are, are not sort of having significant sacrifices um, that they can have a lot of good. So I think it's about finding these creative solutions. Nobody's talking about harming the industry. We're trying to set it up for the future. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that, um, I know Alexander mentioned, you know, pressure in, in your presentation, but I think now that there is, there is pressure from above and there's also pressure from below as well, that a lot of governments are running these initiatives, but also a lot of people are becoming more aware of, um, of these things. And soon, you know, people will vote on their feet. And I guess if you've got two companies doing the same thing, but one is um, more conscious and have got a better footprint and um, more sustainability initiatives, then that one is going to seem more attractive. This is just my personal opinion, but I think that that time is, if it's not come now, it's, it's, we're almost there. And um, we have um, here, oh, sorry, Alexander, just wanted to say something on that. No, I w just wanted to say that, yes, uh, I think the industry has been very much on the defensive and uh, has been 
hiding behind this three percent uh, number and now it's changing you know because of pressure it's becoming more open about what it does it does change it compensates more willingly you know uh, co2 emissions on a voluntary basis i think it's the right thing to do you know show that you're part of a solution that you are acting and as simon said we can be proud of our track record because i think no industry in the world has reduced its co2 footprint by 80 percent in the last 50 years per passenger transporting and that's a track record of the aviation industry so we need to speak our voice 100 percent yeah Joe, i don't know if you, you don't mind don't mind there's a couple of nice comments in the uh, in the chat box i was going to re reply to at least one of them the, the one by tim an i think is a really good question of uh, have we become addicted to aviation in a way difficult to see the sector so I think about this all the time, uh, particularly when you're talking to people about aviation as a sector of choice. I mean, there are thousands of different uh, sectors of choice out there, and why why would aviation be that one? And COVID-19 is doing a lot of things to the industry, but one of the things it's doing is to really test that why do we need aviation question. So I think as, as we come out of the pandemic, people are questioning, well, do I need to fly? Will I fly? Why, why am I flying? What's the industry for? Uh, so is really important and particularly when we're talking to people about engaging them into the industry that we don't assume that that just because we like aviation and we're passionate about it means that they will be and get much better at explaining about why aviation is necessary what it does as suzanne uh, has mentioned the economic benefit of of the industry what it does to people what it brings and not just to take all of that for granted so it's a bit of an opportunity to um out of a crisis to to write on a blank sheet of paper the reasons that we need the industry to, to bounce back and and what it will be used for and um just quickly also tying into louise's question i think there's a number of ways that the cost of training needs to go down and can go down through these initiatives so i think yes there's there are some tactical ones around electric aviation the cost of training aids but also how do we maximize the the funding that's already in the education system and, and make better use of it for aviation. It's already widely used for other sectors, but perhaps in the aviation industry, we've become quite closed, quite uh, introverted, really, in terms of how we've used work with the education system. So I think some, a lot of opportunities to bring the cost down, which is well open the accessibility. Absolutely. Does that, um really appreciate some links. Um, Ryan, you've posted quite a few links, which is brilliant. Um, we have a follow-up webinar at the end of the month where we're going to be concentrating on um, new fuels and new technology. So um, yeah, keep in touch on that one. Um, we've got some um, speakers from some of the, co the companies that you've mentioned here. So um, yeah, I really, really appreciate these links and hope other people do too. Um, yes. Um, I'm just spotting if there is any further comments. We'll make we'll wait just a few more minutes just to see if any come through. I'm just going to scroll scroll down a little bit and just see um, if there are any here. Oh, there's one here from Philip that I missed here. Um, are we sacrificing other things to be green? Do we study how, for example, safety is affected? It's a very good question. This this comes up a few times that you would think that. Um, of those three pillars of sustainability, it's not the only model of sustainability. There's multiple models of sustainability. And in fact, airports in the US came up with their own model. Uh, and, and they've added, in addition to the traditional sort of three Ps, they've added one that talks sort of about the efficiency of movements. Um, and, and so I think it, it's very open to say that um, the three pillars, like any any sort of academic type model, uh, isn't set in stone. It, it should be flexible and adapted to the industry or to the application where it's being used. Used. And I think you're really hard pressed to talk about a sustainable aviation industry without talking about safety. I feel like like safety is completely interwoven into every aspect of aviation. And likewise with my textbook, like every single chapter has accident cases. Like whether you're talking about air law or aircraft design or airport operations, everything has to have safety um, flown or, or sort of drawn through it entirely. So, um, so I don't think it's sort of like a you can't think of it as an exclusive model, that it's only these three things, that, that of course we do need to shape it and adapt it uh, into the environment that we know and that makes sense for a sector. 
Yeah, no, I, I would add also that, you know, any airline in the world that I know of, it's always the motto is safety first, especially in flight tops. So I think, you know, and that's the basis for sustainability. If this industry was not safe, you know, it wouldn't thrive like, like it did. Um, and uh, as we, you know, encourage pilots, for example, to fly green, we always embed safety first, you know. And uh, it, it can be thought that green is against safety, but on the contrary, on a lot of cases, uh, especially by learning from the data, you take better decisions because they are based on fact or based on the experience of all the other pilots instead of your own personal experience. And also, and I remember Bertrand Picard uh, sharing this, this with me, you know, the less fuel you use, the more safe you are, uh, the more, more fuel you have at arrival. So, you know, you have to pay attention. It can go one against the other, but I think nobody in the world is going to go this path. Fantastic. I hope that answers your um, question there, Philip. Um, any last ones coming through? No, I don't think I can see any more at the moment. Um, but of course, um, all three speakers are all um, on LinkedIn. And so I'm sure if you have any follow up questions, um, please feel free. I'm sure the speakers wouldn't mind people getting in touch. And um, yeah, I just want to say a big thank you for everyone that's come and all the interaction engagement on the chat it's been fantastic to see um, i hope you found this of interest i certainly have on a personal um, basis and just a huge thank you to to all three of you for joining us and um and uh, putting the presentations together it's been um, it's been brilliant to hear all the great work and um yeah keep i'll keep watching for for updates of what you're doing in this space um, but yeah congratulations on everything you've achieved so far Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you to the Efficient Base for organizing that. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye now.